Moss has been an obsession of mine for decades, and I've spent the last seven years learning all about moss and its care. Something about this ancient life form speaks to me. I have been known to stop a group of friends just to show them this type of moss or that type of moss, to the point that they called me Inspector Moss. Moss has had some time to master the art of living. In the next 12 minutes or so, I will distill all the knowledge and expertise I've accumulated to help you master the art of moss growing. The main reason I got into terrariums in the first place was to learn how to grow moss. To me, a terrarium without moss is just incomplete. Welcome to the Microverse a large and ancient family. Mosses have existed as early as the Permian period, between 289 million and 251 million years ago. And more than 100 species have been identified from fossils of the Paleogene and Neogene periods, about 66 million to 2.5 million years ago. Moss is a non-vascular plant, meaning they have no true roots or leaves. Moss takes the fungi approach to reproduction, spreading spores, usually from these teeny tiny spore sacs. That sounds weird to say, spore sacs. <laughs> spore sacs! Activate! Now without further ado, let's get into the secrets of mastering moss. Secret number seven, identification. Knowing what type of moss you're planning to grow and being able to identify the moss you have collected is essential. Not all mosses grow under the same conditions or circumstances. Here are some mosses that I have collected and have done my best to identify. I am not a botanist and any identification wouldn't be 100% accurate. Please take this with a grain of salt and let me know if you have identified any of these mosses with any degree of accuracy so we can all learn together. Fern moss my personal favorite in terms of texture as well as color, sporting a brilliant green and fern-looking leaves. This moss is adept to semi-aquatic environments and can often be found growing on rocks or on the ground in or around bodies of water. I even suspect that it's a direct relative or maybe descendant of the aquatic Christmas moss. Hypnum moss also sporting a brilliant green, this moss slithers around the forest floor, slowly but surely spreading on any rough, porous surface it can anchor itself to. This moss tends to look fluffy, as opposed to the next on our list. String moss. Depending on the level of humidity, this moss tends to turn a deep green when saturated with water and is easily identifiable by its appearance. Growing like strings, a mat of this moss tends to look like those stringy shaggy rugs that everyone used to love back in the late 90s. Knowing the type of moss you have, especially when you have purchased this moss or have collected this moss, is essential to knowing its care requirements. With such a large family of about 12,000 species, not all are adept to the same conditions. Secret number six, growing surface. To moss, this can be anything from a waterlogged piece of wood to a clay-based earth or pine needle forest. If you harvest moss from nature, please harvest sustainably. Never take the whole clump of moss as abundant as it may seem. Only take a small piece, so we can keep these amazing life forms in nature for countless future generations to enjoy as they wander nature's corridors. But let's say the moss you would like to propagate grows on a rotten log. It would be a good idea to take a small piece of moss with a small piece of wood that it's growing on. This gives it the best chance to acclimate to whichever condition you will be propagating it in. If the moss grows on a rock, when you bring it home, place it on a similar rock. Some rocks are porous and not all rocks are the same on the inside or have the same structure. So maybe be mindful and see the texture or type of surface that this rock might have before you choose a rock to put your moss on. If the moss is growing on the forest floor, take some of the substrate or earth the moss is growing on. When collecting, make sure the moss is in a Ziploc bag to retain the moisture. The best place to harvest moss is actually in the city. Since moss is a spore-bearing plant, spore sacs activate! Its spores are in the air all around, and a lot of it can be found growing in between concrete slabs in the city. This moss is seen as undesirable when it's grown in the city, and thus will be removed probably by cleaning services or by the city itself. So the best place to start looking for moss is the city around you or your own little town. Please do not take moss from other people's property without asking permission first. Secret number five, protocol. Now that you have identified the moss, 
the conditions this moss thrives in, ethically harvested some, and brought it home. What now? Don't just plop it in a terrarium and expect it to be healthy. It very well could be, just don't expect it to be. A solid protocol will not only help ensure success, it will prevent any potential issues like introducing pests to a terrarium. This is made worse if it's a vivarium with a pet inside. Bioactive terrariums, while not complicated, are a complex multitude of harmonious coexistence between the mycelium network within your substrate and the microfauna, like springtails and isopods, it is a deeply involved ecosystem. And the introduction of a mold spore or predatory centipedes, for example, could upset the balance that has been maintained by the layers of life forms that inhabit your terrarium. Here is a step-by-step -step process of my personal protocol. Step 1. Wash the moss under tap water and remove any particulates attached, like leaves or pine needles or dirt. Second step, place the moss in a container of dechlorinated tap water and rinse it thoroughly. Change the water as the water gets murky. When the water is clear and the moss is clean, I recommend leaving the moss to soak overnight. This helps get rid of any hitchhikers that may have been hiding. Do not let the moss soak for more than 12 hours to avoid the moss breaking down and drowning out. The third step. Now that your moss is sufficiently hydrated, wring the moss out, draining the excess water the moss just absorbed. Wringing out the moss is essential to rebalancing the humidity within the moss. If there is too much humidity in the moss when you put it in the terrarium, it is most likely going to brown out. Fourth step. Place the moss in a plastic container with about one inch of false bottom and possibly a screen barrier. Use a container with a transparent lid and place it under a grow light or near a window that doesn't get direct sunlight. You will need to create holes in the lid to allow some humidity to escape. This helps in not having stagnant air within your propagation bin, thus contributing to possible mold outbreaks. Speaking of mold outbreaks, add springtails to prevent any mold outbreaks. We'll discuss springtails later in this video. The fifth and final step, observe that moss daily for at least the first two weeks. If any mold starts to occur, remove the problem area and continue to observe the moss. Some moss might wilt or brown or die, but some will start putting out new growth. I tend to observe the moss even after new growth pops up. When I am confident the moss is healthy, growing, and the springtail life forms eliminated any potential mold outbreaks, I will consider using that piece of moss in a future terrarium build. Secret number four, bioactivity. Moss in nature has a high amount of bioactivity that has balanced over decades, if not centuries. We just cleaned, sterilized, and isolated this piece of moss from nature, and thus it no longer has access to the multitude of fauna and fungi that contributed to its health while it naturally developed in the forest or city. Enter the terrarium slash moss keeper's best friend, the arthropod a type of land crustaceans, and some of the most successful life forms in the natural world. Like moss, they have also been around for millions of years. In the case of the terrarium keeper, springtails and isopods. In my experience, springtails are the most essential when setting up a bioactive terrarium or propagating moss in a sterile environment. Sterile? Sterile? Sterile. I, I, I'm gonna go with sterile. They are small enough to almost never be noticed in a terrarium. They are also detrivores, meaning they feed on dead or decaying matter. So they will be eating any small mold spores. Wow, well, try saying that 10 times fast. So they will be eating any small mold spores, dead leaves, dead moss, and in turn, they will create small tunnels in the substrate, helping air out the soil for the network of mycelium fungi that is essential for a healthy substrate. As they do so, they fertilize the substrate for any flora life forms you would like to add to your terrarium. Springtails are found throughout the natural world, but all you need is a small starter culture so they can proliferate and make more springtails. These starter cultures can be found or purchased at your local reptile store, at expos, or even online. Secret number three, humidity. Being a non-vascular plant, Moss takes in nutrients from either the ambient humidity or the water soaked up from the surface on which it is growing. Moss loves soft water, often found in rivers and lakes. Depending on your area, your tap water might not be suitable for moss growth. But in either case, the water will need to be dechlorinated. 
Using RO or reverse osmosis water can work if your substrate is nutritious. I found the best method to get moss growing in a healthy way is almost daily introduction as well as extraction of humidity. Which brings us to secret number two. Does it just sound like number two, the poop? And it, this is a very, very secret, <laughs> secret code word. You shall subscribe. Secret number two. Aeration, an often overlooked area, but just as essential as humidity. In nature, moss grows in an environment that is not only humid, but one that has a fair amount of air circulation. Which is why airing out your terrariums or propagation bin is essential to keeping moss happy. Most completely sealed terrariums will not have very healthy moss growth. Which is why I always open my terrariums if no ventilation is present. I noticed my moss propagation bins started doing way better when I added ventilation holes and when I started turning on the fan every morning. Coupled with daily misting, this creates the ideal environment for moss growth. Humidity goes in, humidity goes out. And this happens on a daily basis. Secret number one. <laughs> this sounds just as funny as secret number two. <laughs> secret number one. Lighting. Lighting. This is the most important secret to a lush carpet of moss. While moss can often be found in shaded areas, while not in direct sunlight, the diffused light is actually quite bright. Which is why a lot of people have had great success propagating moss on a windowsill or under fluorescent light bulbs. Please make sure the windowsill does not get direct light or you will cook your moss. Do not cook your moss. The best lighting, in my opinion, is cheaper aquarium lights. The difference a good light spectrum can make in moss growth is not negligible in the slightest. I have had the most success growing moss with aquarium lights. Aquarium lights usually have an RGB spectrum that just hits the plant and mosses differently. And if there has ever been a case study for how light affects moss, look no further than the great nation of Crustacea, once a lush and moss-filled environment. When I built Pandora last minute, I had to switch up the lights in the microverse, resulting in the nation of Crustacea receiving a light half the size of the one it's used to. This sparked a competition for light among the flora of the nation. Being a fairly horizontal growing plant, moss does not partake in these competitions. The combination of lowered light and the dark overlord of crustacea feeding on it, even though he gets fed properly, completely decimated this once luscious bed of moss, leaving behind only the substrate. Lighting is absolutely essential for healthy moss and plant growth, indoor or in a terrarium. Speaking of terrariums, if you want to see how I built this terrarium, click here. If you want to see me go on an adventure, here you go. And if you haven't yet, click Click this button, that one there. Yes, that one. <laughs>